in the, this so we're talking. Oh about my it. God, how horrible! <laughs> well, I wasn't born there, unfortunately. No. Uh, how, how do you get to be a Palo Alto native and not born there? <laughs> That's true. We just claim it. Um, anyway, we want to thank you very much for for giving us some of your time, and um, th this is for the Santa Clara Valley Historical Association. You can give it back to me just before I die. Okay. I might want that in like 15, 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, that's a deal. And um, we, we want to ask your permission that, that we can use this in our upcoming video and maybe even put it out in cyberspace one of these days. <laughs> well, I don't, care what, I don't care what you do with it, really. I mean, uh, uh, as long as you don't do something incredibly embarrassing with oh, it, no, I mean, absolutely. I, I just, you know, I, I, we, I wouldn't do it if I really, if it mattered to me about, you know. We, we quit doing those porno movies last week. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, <laughs> I still have a few extras though in the car. <laughs> you know, I mean. so, so if the lights get to you, say something and we'll shut them off for a second or something. Are you kidding? I'm a performer. Oh, you know, I'm they just it. kill me. I don't know how you I, take I, it. I, hey, I got <laughs> so so hot that they actually burned my neck. I was thinking, I, I I really burned. Actually, I came off stage and I had teeny weeny blisters all over oh my neck. Oh my god! No kid, I couldn't believe it. Oh my god. Yeah, I, it's been that hot. I mean, those suckers do. They, they, when they crank them up, man. I don't know how you play. I, I remember, I saw you uh, years when I was... With great know, pain. Long ago at the Iowa State Fair. At the oh. Iowa State Fairgrounds. And I just thought that was the hottest day on earth. And that was hot. Were, I remember that. I remember so. that. State <laughs> Fair. We played some ghastly hot places. Here. <laughs> oh, shit. One time we played... Uh, uh, what was it? That... Uh, Kansas City, the big uh, big deal there. Right, right, right. Whatever right. they call it. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, the football stadium. You know, um, Big Joe played there. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. We, we played that place, and it was like the 4th of July or something like that. And it was so humid and hot, and it was it was like, it was measured, believe it, believe it or not, it was measured at 130 degrees in, inside the stadium oh at the God. floor. Oh and I, we were playing, we were playing, you know, and, and then passing... Unconscious bodies. You know? oh my it's God. like a, a, you know, like, like a bucket brigade. Boom! Oh they're just going, boom, boom. They're going past this. Boom, boom. They're going past, going past, going past. I mean, the whole show's like, it's like playing in a death camp. You know, God damn it! It was so humid. I mean, it was like, you know, it was so. You know, it was just, you know, everything was wet. It was everything, wet. and then, but we had it easy. After us, uh, Willie Nelson played. You know, first I think, uh, uh, I think old, uh, what's his name? You know, Willie's pal, you know, the, the other Whalen? Texas. Whalen, good old Whalen, you know. And his nice hot black coat, you know. <laughs> and it started raining then, you know. And it, it was that kind of rain that doesn't have any direction. You know, it's just water in the air. <laughs> I mean, you, if you can swim fast enough, you can swim up it. It was so dense. I mean, it was just like, and that was the way it was for the whole rest of the night. It was just like solid water. Oh solid water. Was unbelievable. And still, like so, like hot enough where where the water would land in steam. Yeah. Right, you gotta, so, you gotta be tough. You never saw anything like it. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Okay, let's talk about Palo. Let's get on to the real stuff. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so this is a history of Palo Alto, and, it, and it's actually growing into more of a history of Silicon Valley, and oh, you know, one of the what sort of history? I mean, oh, how's our sound? Do we want the mic where it is now? Cultural or history it or a. Um, we're looking at uh, you know just the, the development of the whole area, and one of the things that mm. that we're really missing. This is a lovely thing that pointed. Yeah. Out, <laughs> is we're uh, we're missing the cultural aspect of it, you know. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, this play, the, you know, it was there, there was a lot happening. I, I've had some interesting connections. When I lived down there as a kid, I I went to a little school called um, Menlo. Uh, pardon me, Menlo Oaks. Yeah, it was the first year that this school. It just been built as a a junior high school. That means seventh and eighth grade down in the peninsula, uh, on the uh, the good side of uh, uh, the freeway. You know, the, the bad side of the freeway was uh, East Palo Alto. Now I used to hang out there, and I went to school there too. Uh, everybody did, and uh, you know, it was just you know that's where the, all the black people live. You know, um, you know. So then they 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 put this new new. Uh, uh, Junior high school, and it it you know we were we were in the first uh, class or so the first first two classes of it, and it um you know it had, it had the oh the thing about it being so close to Stanford, 
the the uh, the education, the school of education and stuff like that. You know, the educational, the people that were studying education or one thing or the other, uh, were, were constantly using our little school as a place where you experiment with programs of one sort or another. And so I was involved in this thing. They had this thing when I was going there called a fast learner program, where the brightest kids first they tested everybody, and the brightest kids uh, were all all like uh, two times, well three times a week went to college level uh, classes in any of uh, you know about maybe half a dozen classes or maybe maybe eight or nine classes that uh, you could choose whatever you wanted. So I, I used to take a an art uh, class and a, a science class, and uh, and got to, basically just got to do what I wanted. And you'd study just that subject all day long. You didn't do any other stuff. It was great fun. I mean, it was like so you know being there. But anyway, when I was down there, I we, I had this teacher a tremendously. Uh, 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 he got in, got in trouble all the time. This guy did. First of all, I was with all the wiseacres. You know, I was with all the smart kids from this this other school that I'd been in, my, my uh, little school, you know. And they put all the bright kids together. You guys, but it was dangerous, you know, because we were little smart asses along with it. So we had this kind of unsteady Second World War vet as our uh, male teacher over in, uh, over in East Palo Alto for the, our first uh, year of junior high school, seventh grade. A guy named Mr. Green. Perfectly nice guy, but, you know, just a little, hey, hey, hey. You know, a little bit of battle fatigue in there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the euphemism they had for it in the post-traumatic shock syndrome. Uh, and he, anyway, he's a little unsteady, and we kind of did this thing of baiting him, you know, and doing all kinds of weird, pulling weird tricks on him and doing all this stuff. And he finally cracked right up and just, he quit, and he beat up some kid, and he just, he left his, like, not last, net, last time I remember seeing him was, he was checking counter at the counter in the Safeway, you know. <laughs> I like him. Hi, Mr. Green! <laughs> <laughs> By this time, he's like, his mouth is moving, but nothing's coming out. You know, he's like... <laughs> anyway, so, as a replacement, now, uh, for, for this, this, this class, guy, the replacement we got next was an extraordinarily neurotic woman from somewhere, God knows where, uh, who was like uh, one of those women who dress, overdresses for, you know, junior high school, you know, like big boobs, you know, like, right, but, but one of those, like, tied down, you know, you know, somebody tied down the metal, the day she's like, Ugh. and she's like, furious, you know, she's operating just under furious, you know, she's got fury, free floating fury for anything, and she also snapped, you know, she finally went, dying, you know, hey, and that was it for her. So finally we got this other guy, this last guy, you know, and we're thinking, now, okay, this guy's going to be easy. We'll just bomb this fucker right out of the water. You know, it's Mr. Johnson. Uh, but Mr. Johnson turned out to be great. He turned out to be really amazing. And he got, he talked to the class like they were, like we were adults. This is the seventh grade, you know. He talked to us like adults. So uh, Mr. Johnson, with Mr. Johnson, I learned lots and lots about every kind of thing. I mean, all kinds of things. By, by the time I, uh, that, that grade it was over, I was starting to get seriously uh, uh, I was starting to learn things you know and he he was incredible he'd come to school he had an MGTC one of those old beautiful uh, MGs the, the kind with the big square hoods not you know not not the little pointy coffin shaped ones but the ones with the big long straight square hood you know it's just growl, growl, that little nasty growl you know and he also had a Vincent Black Shadow the fastest accelerating motorcycle at the time you know it's like a real monster motorcycle I mean, a motor, I think her on a motorcycle. Who ever heard of such a thing? And he'd come out to school in his motorcycle, his black leather jacket, you know. Ah, this is like 1954 or something, you know. I mean, you know, he was really, really outrageous. And uh, he and, and uh, every once, once in a while, his wife would come, and she was, like, beautiful. She was a real peach, you know. She looked real great. And uh, Mr. Johnson uh, recognized that I had a certain amount of facility you know, of withdrawing. I could draw pretty well. And so he had me... You know, wisely, but he also knew, knew that I was a, a you know, a, 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 a confusion artist, you know, like, you know, if he could sink it, sink it, you know. And, uh, but he, he got me involved in uh, doing all these things that, uh, you know, m murals and, you know, supervising all kinds of stuff and uh, doing the class plays and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, so I ended up being that guy. 
you know, and he, he, he fed it back to me. And his wife, who was an artist, I'm sure herself, she was real great. They were, they were real helpful. This guy, Mr. Johnson, I, Dwight Johnson was his name. It turns out at that time, Ken Kesey was like, you know, a, a, you know like, a, like a freshman at Stanford. And I didn't know this until later, of course, but Kesey, and Kesey was telling me about how he used to hang out at Dwight Johnson's house. And Dwight Johnson's the guy that taught, turned Kesey onto pot. <laughs> now that's that, that's what I heard. I mean, but I mean, you know, in terms of like what kind of a place was Palo Alto? I mean, it was yeah. deeply subversive, you know. I mean, but in a visionary kind of far out way, you know what I mean? I mean, because I was ready for anything after I, I met Dwight Johnson. I was ready for anything, you know. I, I mean, I was truly ready for anything. And my further experiences, then I moved back up to the city. My experiences from then on were just reinforced, you know. But 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 I got to be quite a. Uh, um, you know, uh, I guess a bohemian, you know. Because this is before they started using the word beatmaker, uh, any of that stuff, you know, beat generation or any of that was like out and we around. Need to get, I mean, interrupt, do we need to get the thing out of the way? This thing? Should we just, yeah, maybe we need to get this out of the way. Can we get them on this? Sure. Is that, is that going to make it better or worse? It's going to make it worse. Yeah, let me just move this guy out of the way there. <laughs> How's that? Well, you better ask me some direct questions or I'll okay. just hear bo oh, Okay, well, I'll go ahead and do that. I guess, you know, I'm wondering about some things like, uh, <laughs> no, this is great. Uh, this, this is very, you know, we talk to uh, guys like uh, Wozniak, you know, and, uh, and Jobs. And, you know, well, they're much people. younger, you know. Sure, but, but, but what they say is that, that uh, because, you know, of the place and the counterculture that came before them, mm -hmm. that you know, inspired and drove them to pull the computer out of the mainframe. And so yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I believe it, you know, I believe it, because it was hot, it was a happening scene there, you know, really. Hey, Jerry, can I interrupt? By all means, please. The, the, um, did you ever see that Civil War series by Ken Burns? Sure, I know Ken Burns. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. yeah <laughs> nice guy, really, uh, really nice. We, we heard him speak at the end. Of the Terrific filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Anyway, we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're compliment, compliment. We're, we're trying to copy his style. We're stealing his style. Oh, yeah. Well, excellent, Gray. Well, you have my permission. <laughs> I'll try to be more somber and <laughs> leave more pregnant pauses in my... We, we sent him a fax. On so Thursday. <clears throat> Willie Legate. And... Um, anyway, on, on, the, on the tape, the question, the interviewer's questions won't, you know, we're not using that. Only... only Gotcha. So if he says, what was Palo Alto like? I'll just make a statement. I'll, yeah. I'll make a statement yeah. rather than, yeah, okay, sure. So, so it was a, so it was a happening place. I mean, it was, it was a, it was a place, I mean, you know, Kesey was at Stanford taking acid for, for crying out loud. And, uh, well, that was all later. I mean, this much later. I mean, I'm talking about, uh, the part I was talking about before was way when I, back when I was, I was a kid. I mean, this sure. is like 50, in the fifties, you know, and, uh, but it was a short hop from there to when I went back there to about 1960, 59 to 60, when I went, went back. Uh, after I'd been in the army, and um, it, you know, it was I still went to the same. I still found it friendly, and I went to 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 uh, to uh, East Palo Alto, uh, where uh, one of my friends from uh, from junior high school, actually somebody I'd known for a long, long time, uh, was staying at a guy's house in junior uh, junior in uh, for me in East Palo Alto. Because it didn't cost him anything, and he says, uh, "I said, hey, you think I can stay there too?" He said, "Sure, sure. Uh, bring your car. I just bought a car, my first car, uh, which was a uh, a nice fifty Cadillac, a <laughs> fifty Cadillac sedan. I bought from a cook in the army, and so I, I took it and I brought it down to Palo Alto. I had just enough gas to get it down there, and then it died. It died, it died in the par parking lot, past uh, just behind the uh, kind of." Uh, the building where my friend was staying. So uh, I just, you know, I just made it comfortable in there. That was became my house. That was my apartment. Um, so the, the, the first thing, but uh, I would go over to, to my friend Laird. This is, this is guy Laird who I've known all, almost all my life. I mean, he's, uh, I, I, I still, he lives, lives on some land I bought up in Northern California. He's still up there. Uh, he was a guy who was tremendously fascinated with all the beatnik stuff and uh, beat literature and all that, and uh, as was I. And uh, I, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my car, you know. And then some of the time I would sleep inside in the in the uh, in the apartment on the on the folding bed, you know. So one one morning I'm there sleeping, I'm sleeping. This guy comes in, and he says, "Jesus Christ, man!" He says, 
wow, I bet you have to shave three times a day. He says, this black guy named David. And <laughs> they crack me up. I bet you have to shave three times a day. He goes, wow, you must have to shave three times a day. And <laughs> so I got to hang it out with this guy, David McQueen, <clears throat> a real great guy. <clears throat> and we, he and I would go out looking for odd jobs, you know. And I mean, we were like, <laughs> we were like the Laurel and Hardy of East Palo Alto. We would get, we'd find these little, you know, like 20 bucks a day jobs, you know, a moving furniture. Here, here, you take the heavy end. No, God damn it, you take it. No, 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 no. Oh, look out for that. Christ, you know. You're like, <laughs> totally, totally silly. Uh, but he was the, like the first guy that sort of like befriended me a lot, you know. And then uh, sometime or another, somebody brought a guitar, a little acoustic guitar over to uh, uh, this guy's house. Uh, and... I, I played a little, and David McCoon, when he heard me play the blues, he just he killed him. He says, hey, man, I never heard a white, white man with a soul like you, with soul like what you got, man. And uh, I was tremendously flattered, you know, and he, so he says, like, come on, I'm going to take you around. He'd take me around to all of his friends' places, and I'd play, play the blues, and people would go, God damn, who's that white boy play the blues, you know? <laughs> it was great. Everybody would feed me, you know, and pretty soon I got to be, I was totally comfortable there, you know. I was just, I, you know. I didn't think anything of it, really. You know, I, I mean, it, it, I, I didn't. I guess it was exceptional, but it didn't. It, to me, it felt uh, very, um, very normal. You know, I mean, I, I didn't really know anything about the blues, but my brother had been a fan of uh, rhythm and blues, and I'd been listening to it, you know, hell, all my life. I, I mean, at least as far as I can remember. You know, I mean, this is back in the days when guys like uh, uh, John Lee Hooker. Uh, were had hits, you know, in the rhythm and blues world. I mean, these funky country blues guys, you know, and, and the Bay Area had lots of blues cats, old timers, you know, uh, you know, all these guys. They were, I mean, there there were a lot of them. They're they're around, and 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 it was like a sort of distinctive style in the Bay Area. And then there was all that. Uh, there was all those uh, the chess records, you know, that the Chicago blues, Muddy Waters, and all those those guys are so wonderful. I mean that that music I grew up on, you know. I I I didn't didn't occur to me that, I mean that was the music that I I heard. Sure. That and my grandmother was a nut for the Grand Ole Opry. She played the Grand Ole Opry every Saturday night, so I got that sound in my ears, the fiddles, you know. And, uh, you know, sometime around here was the funk music thing started was happening, the, the, the Kings and Trio and all that stuff. And so the thing of having an acoustic guitar and, uh, you know, and being able to pick a little bit. Was like, you know, I, you know, I wanted to. I, I got fascinated by that. I heard this guy play finger style guitar, uh, finger picking, you know, mm -hmm. and I said, "Jeez, I gotta do that. That sounds great, you know. I just gotta learn how to do that, you know." And I, and it, and things got to me that way. I'd be, I would hear something, and I would just love it, you know. And uh, I feel like I was getting closer and closer to the kind of the golden soul of what I wanted to do, you know. The thing about music, you know, and uh, it, 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 music got my attention and art stopped having, you know, I mean, the arts, I just, I didn't even think, you know, I didn't, I just, <laughs> I just want to do this. And so I spent all day picking at the guitar, you know, listening to records and slowing them down and doing that, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. And so, so was there, you know, was there anything about this area, this place that, that would allow a guy like you to flourish? Because Well, I will tell you, man, it, 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 it was, the people there were terrifically kind. I mean, I, I never had to worry about eating. I never had to worry about a place to stay. I, I never had to worry about money. I never had a job. Uh, people looked after me. And I didn't, I didn't ask them to. You know, they, they just did. And I was always so delighted, you know, I was, I was so fun, happy that I, I always said, what can I do? Like, can I do anything to help? Sometimes I could help out in some way, but more often than not, it was just out of the kindness of their hearts. And also, over there by at Stanford, you know, when I got hip to that, I mean, there were these, like, all these Stanford girls, you know, <laughs> the Stanford girls, and they would always bring me, you know, like, great stuff to eat, you know? And, you know. and I met Hunter, of course, who was, uh, when I first met him, that's Robert Hunter? Robert Hunter. Okay. When I first met him, he, like I, had just gotten out of the active service part of, uh, of uh, the service. He was, a, he was a weekend warrior, though, where I was a regular Army guy. And, so, and when, I, when I got kicked out, that was it. I was out. 
a hunter, when he got kicked out, he had to go back every, you know, like a one weekend a month, you know, and all that. So he always had to keep his hair short and he had to do all these things. He couldn't be, he couldn't get totally weird, you know. He, he always had the National Guard, okay, Bob, National Guard coming up. And he'd be, you know, out there like counting the moths on the moon, you know, or something, you know, doing something totally bizarre. And he'd have to come way back from that, you know. Okay, Bob, come on back, you know, get your uniform. And, oh, thanks, right. So, when we first met each other, his car, like mine, had died. He moved it right next to mine on East Palo Alto, you know. So we were there. We were we were automobile natives in this empty lot. And the other interesting coincidence was his car had, he had like two or three great huge, you know, 10-gallon cans of crushed pineapple <laughs> that he boosted, I guess, from Mess Hall, you know. And I, I had... Thousands of plastic spoons and forks. I don't remember why I took them. I thought I thought I should have them though. And they were everywhere. They were in my glove compartment. They were just stuffed up in the seats. They were everywhere. You know, every nook and cranny in the car had it. <laughs> plastic spoons and forks. And so we would have these. You know, that was like breakfast. You know, hey, how about some? How about some fresh? Pineapple today. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds great. You know, glob, glob. And that was, that was it. So we were able to we were able to make do with that for a pretty long time. That was how we got to know each other, really. That was fun. And uh, but see, and, and also see, socially in Palo Alto, there were there were a couple of, of coffee houses uh, like like uh, um, continental style coffee houses. They were you know had a nice informed menu, you know, and a lot of nice good, good coffee. You know, you can get wired to the ID for twenty five cents, and all the, the children, the kids of the, uh, of a lot of the Stanford, um, 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 you know, the, 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 the people that worked at the university, the, 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 uh, staff, you know, and the, uh, uh, you know, of all the various departments, you know, there, there'd be, these, the kids were all terrifically precocious, and there was this one kid, uh, uh, who there was a a San Francisco uh, newspaper columnist at the time named Paul Spiegel, and he, cho he chose chose to spell his name S P E E G E L like Springsteen, Spiegel, <laughs> and then Paul Spiegel and his son. I known his son for uh, I known his son actually since back when I was in you know junior high school. Then I I, I he was like a year young uh, younger than me or so, and. Uh, he was kind of like the lion of the little this little social scene. So I met him, you know, and we hit it off pretty well immediately. And we, we we got off on each other. We were both heavy readers, and uh, we both had uh, shared the same sort of uh, uh, cruel sense of humor. <laughs> and we were both pretty much assholes, and we had a good time together. But. Very shortly after we got to get, we were getting to know each other one night uh, after a party somewhere. And, uh, there was an automobile accident, and, and Paul was killed. And I and some of the other guys, there was four of us in the car. We were all injured some, and uh, but uh, Paul was Paul died. And so in the aftermath of that, the, that whole little scene kind of pulled together and, and kind of gained a, a kind of sense of purpose, you know. Uh, because he was like a really gifted, he was a gift. He was a painter, and he he had the touch. He had the thing, you know. Would've, he would have become good. Um, so that was that was like kind of one of those little kicks in the ass you need to get you going, you know. Uh, that was one of one of my kicks that it worked pretty well, and I mean, really for me, it just uh, then I started to get really serious about music, and I. Well, I heard, let me just, I mean, so why did you stay out here? Why didn't you go like back to New York? I had no interest in going to New York. You know, I really didn't. I mean, I liked it here, and I also, I, I the people here, I loved them. You know, I cared, I cared about the people that I was, that were my, you know, my little, my social set. You know, I loved them. I thought there, I thought there was a lot going on there. You know, and I thought, uh, I have time to go to New York. I can go to New York some other time. You know, and you know, I just it, 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 New York wasn't calling to me. You know, I really, you know, we say about that time, too, people from New York were starting to come out here, you know, not from the West Coast, you know. Oh, yeah, this is a real creative, uh, sort of a little uh, 
birthplace of a lot of. It was just starting to light up a little out here, you know, and and that one. Then you know things started re really rolling. Then I mean, it, this is right about when like. The, this is still early 60s, early this is like 62, 61, 62, 63, right around there. I mean, I still had a few years to go as a, uh, during the folk scare, you know, uh, to get to be a real competent bluegrass player, and that was my connection to New York. That's where I met the New York guys, because they, they were the first serious folkies. And so the bluegrass players, the first ones that I met that could really cut it, were from the East Coast. Yeah, big scene out there. Yeah, and, and they were amazed that, that I was out here on the West Coast, I, although there was a couple of us out here that could play well. And so that, that, that started happening, you know, that reciprocal thing and, uh, you know, like that. And it, it started, once it got, got rolling, it started moving really fast, you know, all this stuff started moving really fast. I mean, within the space of a year or so, then of course Kennedy got snapped, boom, bam, you know, oh, whole other world, you know, new reality, you know, put on the brakes, you know, to check things out, you know, you know what I mean? It was like, uh, that was another impetus. It was like, now what? Uh, okay, fuck you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> fuck you, you know. If you're gonna shoot, the, if, if every time you have something gets good, it's gonna get shot. Fuck it, you know. <laughs> We're not gonna let you have it anymore. <laughs> you know, things, everything changed then, you sure, know. Sure. And also, that's about the time we started to leave leave Palo Alto. I mean, Palo Alto started seeming too small, and uh, mm -hmm. and other things were calling us. And the city seemed like a better. Well, the city, yeah, was was the the acid test actually is what got us, which was yeah. like. Uh, like we went to the moon or Mars or something like that. We went to another reality rather than this one, and it it served better, you know. Uh, you know, it it was uh, truly cosmic kind of entertainment. But it, it you know, and it actually it actually brought a lot of Palo Alto, Palo Alto along with it. It's strange, you know. I mean. You know, if you, it'd be hard to, it's hard to sort of separate one thing in and out, but it, it was the lifestyle, the way of life there was easy. People weren't afraid. You get out and be on the streets in the middle of the night hollering and nobody would bother you. The police wouldn't think there was somebody being killed, you know what I mean? It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't worst case uh, um, preparation, you know, they weren't, re they weren't ready for the, the most horrible thing to be happening. And it, it really was horrible. It was almost always innocent and, and pleasant, even. And... Uh, it was just a great, great way to live, you know. It was a great place to live, a great way to live, and the, and the people were nice. And uh, we we were lucky enough to get to be able to get weird at a time when, uh, as far as psychedelics were concerned, they were still legal, for one thing. And the other thing was that nobody knew what the fuck they were. Yeah. You know, so if your if your behavior defies description, you know what I mean. What's the guy doing? Well, I don't know. He's kind of he's sort of standing up. So he's over upside down by the lamppost over there. He's got one leg uh, wrapped around this the telephone pole, and he's he's pumping his arms out and he's screaming something about Merry Christmas. I don't know what that is. You know, it's like you know your behavior is so weird, and you know, and but you're not harming anybody or scaring anybody. I mean, the people realize that this guy's harmless. You know. It, it it really it's okay. You can be as weird as you want. It's like in in England, they have this thing where uh, as long as you don't bother anybody, yeah. you can be as weird as you want. And they kind of they kind of treasure their mad people. You know, they kind of like it. if you're in, if you're crazy, no problem. You know, <laughs> less yeah. uptight, more fun time, more just a period that. Was uh, yeah, well, for for us that we had as much time to be young and uh, carefree and and having a wonderful time. Uh, sort of that sort of life. We had as much of it as anybody could possibly want. I mean, it, it was it was really great. It really was, and, and it, it was an, also enough time to to uh, develop the skills that you needed. Like for me, for being able to uh, spend enough time working on my playing, so that uh, it wasn't developed in a frenzy. It was developed out of love, my own personal love for it. You know, and you know. It, that's really well put. Uh, well, I don't know any other way to say it, really, because uh, I did meet people who learned under other way, other ways, you know, other sort of other envelopes, and it's not that that they could do. I mean, that what they did technically was any better or anything, but sometimes it had uh, a darker purpose to it, sort of. I mean, it was good and everything; it was well executed, but it, but sometimes it lacked that the thing of heart, you know. How music should have should always have it, sure. even mechanistic music. Okay. Two minutes to the end of the day. I got nothing else to say about it. <laughs> well, I, I want to. John was very, 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 very yeah. pumped about this, and I, I went. I promised him that I would not. What you're trying to do with this film is show that the.
Palo Alto and the, 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 that part of the world, this part of the world, has, has gone through a, a genuine historical renaissance period. Um, and in music's part of that, art's part of that, you're, you're more than just one mission. I don't think that I don't think that Palo Alto had a clue. It, 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 the reason anything at all might have happened there was because there was a lot of people there, and it's a college campus is always kind of protein. It it was not that anybody welcomed any of it, you know. Nobody welcomed any of it, you know, really. And it really, it was a couple of doctors that opened up the, the place there, the tangent, the top of the tangent, and uh, they were slightly visionary, you know, just slightly, you know. And they liked the music, and, and that was it. It wasn't wasn't because there uh, any part of say the university or the the hierarchy of uh, the community itself. You know, any not a clue. <laughs> you know, I mean, not to, I don't know whether it would have been possible for it to to, to do anything but scare it. You know what I mean? It, it, it wouldn't have been helpful. And the nature of what was happening was so delicate and so bizarre. And it had a kind of, uh, it had a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a kind of unfocused, um, diffuse quality. I mean, it's the sort of thing that it, it's difficult to talk about even now because there was the the point about it was that it didn't have a center. It wasn't directed from by outside forces or by the normal uh, history as we normally uh, perceive it. it. It was not about those things. You know that's that's that wasn't what it was and that wasn't what it was about. And uh, it was about possibilities, I think. And they were in the air. They were just in the air. And everybody was also waiting with the sense of something is about to happen was so imminent, you know what I mean? It was just like everybody knew it, you know? Everybody was waiting for this thing to happen. Something was gonna happen. And it was just so obvious, and everybody did what they could to make it happen. You know, people would try weird shit, you know what I mean? I mean, everybody was, everybody got turned on to pot during this period and loved it. Everybody tried other, other forms of, uh, other kinds of drugs, crystal and so forth, and didn't like it so well, or liked it a lot, but it made him crazy did lots of, you know, uh, and really what it was was everybody was waiting for uh, psychedelics, everybody was waiting for LSD uh, because of what we'd heard about it, what everybody had heard about it, and it seemed like, you know, it seemed like that thing of the sense of losing faith in this reality, like, this reality is not... It, this is not that great, you know. This is just is not that. Great. This can't be all there is. There's just not enough to it. There's not enough to it. It's not that interesting. It isn't. It isn't enough fun. It it doesn't. It doesn't require enough of me. It it it's not a challenge, you know. Uh, there got to be. There's got to be more. When LSD hit the streets finally, that was like it. There, here you were looking for more. Here it is. This is more. This is more than you can imagine. I mean, and for me, that's what that's what that was. I mean, I, it's not. I realize that uh, drugs are not politically uh, correct right at this moment, but uh, you know, psychedelics. Uh, for the people that were waiting for them, they were exactly the thing. They were exactly the thing. You know, I mean, uh, because they have that way of being. Individual, they're not. Uh, nobody, people don't experience exactly the same effects. They experience themselves, uh, and themselves. Sometimes, themselves. It turns out to be utterly delightful. Sometimes it turns out to be a total bummer. But either way, you you've got more of it to work with when you've taken psychedelics and seen the bigger picture. You know. So sometimes it meant that I gotta get to work or I'm gonna be this way all my life, you know? Sometimes that's what it meant. Sometimes it meant no more uh, psychedelics, they're, they're too weird for me, but I think I'd better go join a monastery somewhere. Because the only way to work this out is the long, slow way, you know? Uh, un, un, unpanicked, unhurried. Um, some people, it was like, psychedelics, yes, okay, where's the next terminal? You know, I'm ready, you know, <laughs> I'm ready to move to the next square. You know, and 
you know, it, it, it hit people where they needed to be hit, and it was the thing that everybody was waiting for. You know? And it, it was, and everything opened right, up right in front of it, boom, like that. It was, it was truly amazing. And that, that, that hole lasted for about a year, year and a half, maybe. There was like this magic kind of hole. Uh, when the LSD was still legal, it hadn't been made illegal yet, and uh, the idea of being high was so new that nobody recognized it. And uh, you were free to, to freak out completely, get as high as you wanted to, out in the open. <laughs> and they couldn't take you to jail for it. And that was really a wonderful thing to have experienced. You know, that was like, you know, I mean, after that, there's no really, I mean, for me, in my life, there's no turning back. There was no back. You know, not, not just a matter of turning back, but the idea of backness was gone. <laughs> and like, all directions were forward from there. You know what I mean? And uh, as far as like information and uh, material, you know, like, it's like having so much material, I mean, and it, it stays with you too. Like the experiences that I experienced back, back in those days, the psychedelic days, they were more real than anything I ever experienced in this on this level. You know, they were they were way more real. You know, they had they were so much more detailed and lifelike and uh, and uh, beautiful and horrible and everything else and and, and 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 all the way you know down to the teeny teeniest weeniest uh, smallest iota of discriminant material. Uh, every bit of it was, you know. Was it, it was incredible. I don't know. You know, I uh, that that's just one of the one of the reasons I sort of disqualify myself from this discussion on a serious level is because there simply is uh, conventional wisdom uh, won't accept uh, this subjective of a uh, overview. You know, for me, that's the point. That's what it well, uh, that's what it was about. It was that it was was subjective and uh, you know. I'm, I'm so glad that it happened in my lifetime. Yeah. And that I got to experience it at its purest, you know. I'm just, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world, really, don't you? And, and uh, hey, that's it, you know. <laughs> you remember, go for it, yeah. You remember the first time you met Bill Chrysler? I don't remember the first time. I, I met him when he was working with a friend of mine named Troy Weidenheimer. We played in a band together. Uh, I forget what the name of the band was. But we played a band together. I played bass and he played drums. But he was 17 years old. And, uh, you know, he was like, he's a teenager, just a kid, you know. And I played a few shows with him and stuff like that. And then when, when uh, me and uh, Big Fan and Weird talked about ha uh, putting together a, a, you know, like an le electric blues band or something of that sort, uh, the only drummer that I really played with around that area that I felt really had a nice feel was Bill. He was 17 or 18. By, by now he's 18. Uh, so I talked to him, and he was he was just as weird as ever. And I, I really really didn't understand anything he said. <laughs> he was just like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I, what? He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I okay. <laughs> I asked him if he wanted to play. He was delighted. He was just all over the place, and, and he, you know, so we played. It was great. You know, it worked. He worked out fine. Uh, I didn't realize what a truly strange person he was until we started getting high together. Then that was a whole other, no, a whole other bill jumped out, you know. And, uh, was, that 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 bill is a total, uh, a total imp. He, he told me that he remembers meeting you or seeing you play at the tangent upstairs. And he, yeah. He told himself, I'm gonna play with that guy. Oh, that's neat. What, what about Pigpen? You, you write about you. I big new big man. I don't even remember when I met when I met him. He was like fourteen. He was like a grubby little kid, you know, from that lived down there and uh, near Los Altos, and uh, you know he played a, a little harmonica and a little a little guitar. He used to ask me to show him some guitar licks, blues licks, and I would show him stuff. And he picked up the guitar by himself, and in about a month, in about a couple of months, he was playing, you know, like pretty nice. He had a real feeling for the music, and he it was in his ears. It was his father was the first. Uh, di uh, uh, rhythm and blues disc jockey in the Bay Area. So he, he'd been hearing the music all his life and, and uh, he had a real feel for it. It was very natural to him. He was a great guy, he was very funny too. He had uh, uh, 
big big bit had a, a, a real pixie quality. It was just lo really lovable, really fun. He was a sweetheart. To, to jump forward to the future a little bit, I, uh, I interviewed Ed McCracken over at Silicon Graphics. Who's, uh, um, he's, he's the CEO of there. He's a real fan of yours. He's got your art up on the wall. He's wearing one of your ties. Have um, you ever met him? We can afford him. <laughs> I haven't met him yet. I'm, but I'm, I'm trying to, to, to wheedle uh, uh, maybe a, you know, a bar or a loader uh, a computer, uh, his Silicon Graphics uh, rig that I could screw around with. <laughs> I like the power it's got. Um, in, in the respect, it'd be great that they've really gone towards high tech music and it's cutting edge. Can you talk about it? Uh, well, I don't know about the music itself, but just the approach, you know. Uh, we well, it's just it's just part of that's what you it's, we're just moving into the '90s. I mean, you know, or actually moving into the uh, the next millennium. It's uh, uh, our music wants to exp uh, have as much uh, as many possible ways to express itself as it can. It's just it's just another tools, more tools. You know. Do you, do you ever get together with some of the companies that develop this stuff? No, not really. Uh, I I tend not to be. Uh, I'm not a, uh, uh, I, so far. Let me put it this way: my ideas tend not to be musical. I don't want really want to be in the musical part of it. Uh, I'm much more interested in the the, the graphic part of it. Uh, you know, it's possible that sometime I'll do get into the musical part of it. But and I mean, I'm I'm converse with it. I'm conversant. Okay. But it it isn't isn't my favorite way of working yet. Did you work with Roy Rosenfeld? Is that name ringing a bell? Uh, yeah. Planet Blue, I think is what he works now. Uh, down in L.A.? Yeah. Yeah, Maury, yeah. I saw the video you guys made. It was really nice. Yeah. He's a nice guy. Yeah, he's good, too. Um, now, now, Dana Morgan was a place you used you used to teach. And I, Corey Lurios, I've talked to him a few times. He's going to write the music for this after, after we're, we're all through. We hope. And... Um, <laughs> He said that he used to teach at Dana Morgan and go over to Swain's House of Music and... I didn't really work at Swain's. I, I used to work at uh, uh, Dana Morgan's and then me and Bob used to go over and work at uh, this place called... Uh, what the hell is it called? Drapers? Gu no, guitar maybe it was Drapers. No, it wasn't Drapers. It was, it, was, it was Guitar City or something like that. It was... What the hell is the guy that ran it? I don't remember. It wasn't Drapers, I don't think. No. It was up on uh, El Camino. Uh, and this very nice guy ran the place. It was a good little guitar store. We was a, uh, Weir and I both taught up there, you know, like after hours, kind of. It was our moonlighting job. <laughs> <laughs> with, um, with the Warlocks, I remember you going to see Bill play, because he was my drum teacher back in those days. And, uh, and uh, you're playing at Magoo's down on... Magoo's, yeah, that was our first gig. I know, well, yeah, the close to it. My yearly, yeah. And, and he t I asked him how much he was getting paid, and he said free beer and pizza? Yeah, something like that. I don't even know if we got pizza, to tell you the truth. We didn't charge anybody anything to get in or anything. But the place was packed. It was packed to the rafters. The second, we played on like on Tuesday night or something like that. The second Tuesday night we played, the place was absolutely floor to ceiling. I mean, it was on, on the street. It was just totally, you know, it was amazing. It was incredible. I mean, the first time we played, it ended up that way. Second night we played, it started that way. You know, it just got more and more intense, you know. Ah, and they didn't let us play the third night. <laughs> that was it. Too much, you know, too much going on. And then with, with um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is that you, you've been associated with people like Kim Kesey and Jack Cassidy and these great minds um, from back in those days. Well, you know, not, not Jack Cassidy, uh, Neil Cassidy. Neil Cassidy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, was there something too? Could you have done that in uh, Boise, Idaho? I don't think so. I think you'd have to be around the Bay Area, but you also had to be a fan of the, the, the that world. I mean, it would help 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 to re have read the books and you know who uh, know you know. And I mean, Neil Cassidy was always around in my, in the world that I was in. He was like peripheral to it somewhere or another. When I was at the Art Institute, he was somewhere around North Beach there. You know, I knew people who knew him and. I knew people who knew him all over the way, and I finally I got to I got pretty close to him myself. I got to be good friends with him, and uh, he's was one of those guys that was, truly was uh, a, a very special person, you know. And one of those one of those things. I mean, you know, I, for me, I my life is, uh, I mean, psychedelics and Neil Cassidy are almost equal in terms of influence on me. 
have you because Neil Neil uh, he, I, I don't even know how to say it I don't even know how to say it. he was his own art you know it's like he wasn't a musician he was a Neil Cassidy you know what I mean he was, he was like a, a, a set of one you know and uh, and and he was it you know he was the whole thing top bottom and beginning everything and uh, people knew it you know and people would would be would be drawn to it and destroyed uh, or else they would be repelled from it you know and maybe people reacted every conceivable way I thought he was hilarious I thought he was just the greatest thing in the world you know to, to, I really loved him and I had no fear no fear of him uh, uh, I never worried about whether I was going to lose my life riding in a car with him I knew I was going to lose my life I didn't worry about whether I was going to I knew I was going to uh, but learning how to give everything up like that is a wonderful thing it's a wonderful tool and I don't know how else I could have learned it I, nothing else would have made me learn it you know just like racing over San Francisco you know like the San Francisco say the Pacific Heights you know at like 65 miles an hour you know making those hills and those corners and going through the signals and in the middle of traffic just you know I'm doing, doing things where you know, I, we can't possibly make this corner don't even try it and Neil is like not even he doesn't even look like he's paying attention to anything to the road or anybody or anything and he, he's like and he just whips it and you you, you look out the window and you you, there's, you you realize you're on the sidewalk you know and you're you're like a half an inch away from a telephone pole over here and things I mean it's just it's just you know it's just it's just insane you're totally insane man you're totally safe you know, nothing happened you, know, you can't you can't believe that you were able to he did it all the time. He's, uh, he was, that was the thing that he was truly great at. Um, there was other things that he was merely very, very good at, you know, <laughs> but that was the thing he was truly great at. He was really something. He was enough to boggle about, you know, quite a few people. I mean, uh, Neil was very taken with, uh, I mean, Kesey was very taken with him, and uh, obviously Jack Kerouac was, you know, and he, he, he was, an unbelievable human being, you know, the energy that he had, and the the vocabulary that he had of um, of gestures and expressions, and it was just oh boy, he was funny. And he also had a tremendous rap too. He could, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I don't know what to say about Neil. It, you know, some people just just thought he was crazy. You know, he's crazy. Get him out of here. I don't want him here. You know, a lot of women. He frightened them. He was too too out of control. Um, and, you know, and a lot of men tr felt that they had to somehow get involved in contests with him. You know, and of some kind. And that doesn't even work out good. Uh, they'd always. I don't know what they'd always try something and it, it didn't work out. The thing about uh, Neil was people wanted to compete with him without having any uh, sense of what competing with him were, might mean. You know what I mean? Like, what is it competing with him? I don't know. Staying up all night? I don't know what is competing with him. You know, it, was, it was one of those things that wasn't obvious. Anyway, if you want any more than that, you're going to have to talk to somebody else. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome.